From Wacko Chaco Studio, I am Ashwin Chaco, and this is The Fruitful Life, a show about the business of creativity and the stories behind the creators that have made their dreams a reality. Hey folks, welcome to The Fruitful Life, the one and only Jen and Amy Hood. Hello. What an intro. <laughs> Superb, not a mistake. I want everyone to know that was a one take, one shot. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so for the very small audience that might not know you, can you guys introduce yourselves? Tell us who you are and what you do. There's plenty of people who don't know. I when I go to the grocery <laughs> store, no one stops me. <laughs> no one knows me. Um, so we are Hoodspa. We are the founding uh, duo behind uh, this brand identity and type design studio. And we just, we do a lot of rebrands, a lot of new brands, but also a lot of rebrands, um, logos, type, color, as well as making, you know, custom fonts, uh, things like that. So it's a lot of fun. We've been at it for like 12 years now. I it's kind of crazy. Yeah, we started in 2011 and um, Jen and I's lives have been intertwined since birth because we're twins, but also because we both somehow got the same talent, which kind of blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're both like kind of artistic. So when we both realized that art was very hard to make it in, we both were like, hmm, graphic design, communication arts, a practical art form. So, um, but yeah, so we've been doing Hoodspa together for 12 years. Wow. That's... That's great. A decade and another to go. <laughs> right. And some change. Yeah. Um, so before I get into learning more about you guys, this is one question I ask all my guests. If you could be a fruit, what fruit would it be and why? <laughs> Okay, right now I'm really into mangoes. They're so sweet. It's like candy. It feels like cheating, you know? It's like, how are they so delicious? Okay, along and they're the smooth and yes, mm. it's like yummy. Yeah, along the same lines, have you ever had cotton candy grapes? They're a cross between not. red and green, a certain like varietal of red and green grape that literally tastes like cotton candy. It's crazy. And I hate grapes. Grapes are so <laughs> basic. It's like, grapes are the most like default fruit, like after apples. <laughs> But um, when you have a cotton candy, candy grape, it like it takes it to another level. So I'll, I'll go with that. This is when we really it's like science at its finest, you know, like everyone can get behind this. <laughs> I need to find these grapes. They sound amazing. They're not even genetically engineered. I guess I think they're, they are. They're, but I mean, like, what do you call it when you crossbreed? Yeah, they like pretty yeah. much just like, yeah, they like combine two vines or whatever. Old school. Way, they're like know? double the price, though. So just just get ready to shell up. <laughs> Yeah, and I seriously miss mangoes because mangoes was my thing in India, but it's very mm. hard to get a new, like a good mango in Ireland because they all come from okay. like Spain or whatever. Yes. So that's so funny. Yeah, because we grew up in Kentucky for a lot of our formative years, Kentucky and New York. And I swear I had never had a mango till I moved back to California when I was like 16. And also like avocado was a dirty word in yeah. Kentucky. It's like, who do you think you yeah, are? It's like, <laughs> that that liberal coastal fruit, you know, or vegetable is like it, it said something about you or something. But uh, but now we live in a land of plenty with avocados. Yeah, and mangoes. avocados and mangoes galore. Yeah. When you said Ireland, it's almost like you switched to an Irish accent. <laughs> do you can you pick it up when you're around? like Irish people do you uh, tend to like mirror back what you hear I think so yeah uh, I it's automatic reflex for me um, my wife says when I speak to my parents on the phone that my accent changes more to an Indian accent so it's just because yeah. like I was in an international boarding school and I think it's just a reflex mirroring the people around you so you've kind of communicate better or yes. on their level or something totally. I don't know that's so interesting yeah we met a Danish guy and he learned English in Wales so he spoke spoke with a Welsh accent when he spoke English and it was so wild it was because just, not only is there yeah. the Danish level then there's the Welsh level which is also wild you know and yeah. then it, it was just like so fascinating so interesting. but I we're the same way we moved around a lot as kids and I feel like I'm always mimicking and parroting how people talk and I think as creatives too, we're always kind of like, we're very like, almost like mockingbirds. We take a lot in and we're always like trying to figure out how people do things. But um, I, I am like such a sponge for jingles, <laughs> like anything where someone says something in a unique way, it's like in there forever. Yes. And um, <laughs> I don't know, I, I we're like parrots for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think it's just intuitive to us, mm -hmm. but let's dig into more of your own journey. So you sort of touched on it, you realized you were both artists, but how far back does that go? Like, was it, did you feel like when you were kids, you were super creative? 
uh, did you think art was or like graphic design was a potential career or it was like down the line and you're suddenly were like nothing else is working art it is (laughs) I know I I think we luckily like our mom always really encouraged our creative pursuits and she always kind of like put us she always made them like a practical thing for us like you know we presented her a mural for our room and she let us paint our room and like you know things like that and she would you know let us do um art competitions and things like that at school and um the school we went to in New York too, they had these really amazing programs where every kid was required to do either band or orchestra and they had tons of arts programs. So I think there was just a lot of opportunity just to like really dig in and, you know, see if that would work. Early and on, like early in on. elementary school. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, we made our own like little elementary school, like comic strip, me and Jen, like, I think we were always trying to create like the magic that was in that book, The Stinky Cheese Man. Do you remember that book? <laughs> <laughs> it was so irreverent. It was kind of like mad TV meets like a children's book. And it was like, <laughs> it was so irreverent. It was kind of like James and the Giant Peach, where it was like slightly scary, but like really just magical and like treats kids like, you know kind of more like adults Uh so I think we were always just trying to like create our own thing create our own characters and um so it was kind of a natural evolution to then high school when you're like you know you're creating t-shirts for for you know the 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 high school team and um your friends who are in bands like you're starting doing cd covers like you don't really know you're designing you're just applying like you know illustrated really you're just illustrating and then scanning it and (laughs) you know making a lot of copies and cutting it and putting into the jewel case (laughs) the cd jewel case but then eventually um when we i was in community college and i we were just taking art classes i took a few graphic design classes and i was like oh this is like a real job that we could do you know and so i told aim and then, you know, someone at your coffee shop offered you a, a design internship. And then from there, it just like kind of all just rolled into just- Yeah, it was kind of kismet. It was like everything was sort of aligning, you know? Mm-hmm. And and then did you guys work in like agencies or did you guys go freelance straight away? What, what was that career path like? The first job, which was also, also our on-the-job training, because we didn't finish uh, college. We, um, the guy who came into your coffee shop, he worked at a local little like- um, mailer like a little uh, newspaper mailer with the coupons in it you know and it's oh, a little yeah, yeah. booklet and you swip through and you get like carpet cleaning ads and but tree it also trim has, like, local interest stories with like you know the local artists or the local like cover band yeah you know? so it was like a, that kind of thing and he was like hey I'll teach you everything you need to know about these programs I just need I think he was just looking for cheap talent who with a good attitude and he really liked Amy so he brought Amy in on that when we were really you know uh, in uh, community college and then she tagged me in and because it got so busy so quick they had like three different issues of this like we just quit community college and just did that and just learned on the job and it developed some very terrible design habits as far as like using the programs completely wrong you know we were not, not all of them yeah, but, most but we of were them. laying out a magazine in adobe illustrator for a couple of years which is just like it insane, makes no sense insane, I, mean, like, I don't even like i'm trying to remember how we did it <laughs> yeah i can't imagine just the file size like how it didn't crash and we and i think that the Jason, the guy who hired us, who's awesome. Shout out to Jason Staggs. Every, um, everyone had um, hacked versions of Adobe programs. So it's just like everything was crashing all the time. He and... did it properly. It's just somehow we slipped through the cracks and did yeah. it improperly. Anyway, so we learned there, but then um, eventually that uh, magazine kind of shut down and we were trying to get a job um, around like 2008 and there just, nobody was really hiring. 2011. Or two thousand, yeah, yeah, yeah and um, and we didn't have our portfolio was just ads. It was just coupons, and it just was not. It didn't look good, you know. What and I mean? kind of like local magazine, yeah. Layouts. Like, and we didn't finish school, so we looked terrible on paper. So we ended up just. We always had a, a network of friends that we were always like trying to start little things with. So we told them, hey, we can do design, and they were always asking for little favors. And we just started doing a lot more freelance, and then we just were like, okay, let's just try and start Hoodspo while we try and get a real job, and then it it kind of just. We got it just took off from yeah. there. Yeah. It became a life of its own. It wasn't profitable at first by any means. But you know, when you're young, because we were young, it was helpful. We didn't have anyone depending on us. We were sharing an apartment. We were working out of our, you know, apartment bedrooms. And um, so the overhead was really low. We just really had to bring in enough to just barely meet uh, expenses, <laughs> you know, until we figured out the rhythm. We got some, you know, business books, asked for help from mentors, and then finally got it kind of greased into something that made sense, you know. And the name Hutzpa is that from like a nickname you got from friends, or was that like? It's actually Yiddish. 
So okay. it's like, it's a Yiddish term and it means like moxie or bold or like brazen. And it was a term that we grew up with. Like everyone used Yiddish terms in upstate New York, Syracuse, where yeah, we yeah. were growing up. So we just thought it was like common vernacular. Well, it turns out nobody on the West Coast, very, very much, not as many <laughs> understand it. They're like chutzpah. How do we say this? Chutzpah? Yeah. And our last name is Hood. So it just kind of fit into the word yeah, chutzpah yeah. like fairly well. But um. Yeah. And then we just stuck with it. It's really easy for SEO differentiation because <laughs> exactly. it's only us and a Jewish rapper. And it's like, <laughs> we're both like top tier on this surge term. And I'm like, pretty sure he's retired since. Oh, you know, okay, so. yeah. We need to collab with I him. Know. We've always said this, but we really need to collab with him. him. <laughs> I actually read a really interesting, somebody posted this the other day, but the reason that a lot of rappers like leave uh, letters or numbers out of like a name and use like kind of weird characters is for SEO. To, so it's easier to find them. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? That's crazy. Marketing ploys. Smart. Yeah, I think uh, nobody else has Wacko Chaco, so. I know, yeah, you're Genius. good. You're Genius. good there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, there's that mnemonic thing, or not mnemonic, there's that onomatopoeia thing where it just like, it's some, it sounds like a fun action word. I love that. Wacko Chaco, yeah. yeah. You're just yeah. like, it feels right. Yeah. Well, that, that was like a, a nickname I got in high school because of the weird clothes I used to wear. They called oh, me Wacko amazing. Chaco because Chaco is my that's, last name. Right. And uh, yeah. That's hilarious. Oh, that's I cool. Love that. So like um, you guys started your your thing together, but I want to know because I have two brothers and we fight a lot and sometimes egos can get in the way. <laughs> what has that sort of relationship been with you two? Because I mean, uh, especially with design and, you know, maybe there's slight differentiation in aesthetics and mm -hmm. does that create like head buttoning or have you worked out like specific roles within um your totally. careers yeah I think there's always a little bit of friction when it's family you know like there's yeah. a reason that they say never work with friends and family because it could totally demolish and blow up your whole life that, like anyone who's done freelance or run their own business knows that like your first clients are always friends and family the yeah. very people yeah. they tell you never to use are the only people who will use you at first <laughs> yeah so but, yeah. I think and there's something nice at the end of the day when it's like even if you disagree you know at the end of the day like this person loves me they have my best interest at heart it's not personal we just both really believe that we're right. <laughs> and the other one is absolutely wrong. Very strongly. Yeah. Really. <laughs> but as twins, our whole life has been learning to share things that we would rather have our own copy of. <laughs> like, get your own face. No, I'm just kidding. But um, no, like, well, our mom was really strict with us growing up about like sharing and being nice to each other. And we still fight and we're very competitive because we're twins and we're always compared. So it's always like, oh, I can do that better. So I think that actually makes us um, better at what we do sometimes, but we've definitely had to learn to uh, respect each other's yeah. opinion and learn to give way on certain things. So on each project, one of us is the final say. So it'll be like, okay, we work together, but at the end of the day, this is like, you're the final choice because if not, we could just literally go for days on why me or you should be right or wrong. So we make the best case we can. And if we really cannot convince the other one, then it's whoever is running the project gets to make the final choice. Cause at the end of the day, there's multiple right answers to any yeah. design question yeah. or, or problem. And we both know that we trust each other as far as we know, we'll do good work. It's just more of like preference probably. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. And I feel like, I mean, you can even talk to this because any adult has to learn how to, you know, collaborate and give a little and negotiate in a, in a relationship, any relationship yeah. that works and business is no different. And we do it every day with clients. I think it's just sometimes harder with collaborators, you know, because you feel like this is my area of expertise and like, you should understand, you should think the way I think what's wrong with you. <laughs> um, you know, we kind of expect our clients maybe not to see it as quickly or as clearly, but it can be tough with collaborators. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also because we're in the same world and then you know, to have a contentious view or like to have a different view from your own, suddenly it's like, oh, but I thought we were on the same page. Totally. You know? <laughs> oh, the, the, just the absolute like depression when you're like, how do we not see this the same? Like, <laughs> uh, how are you seeing it this way? Like, I, it's just, it can be really tough for sure. How do you, I mean, I've always wondered like, cause you're someone who does almost more like collaborations it's like they want you to do your style but I'm sure they also some of your clients also are kind of saying but what if you do this or can you do this instead and you're thinking I could but I, I really don't want to this is I'm supposed to do my style here like is that harder because you're almost like known for 
your thing you're an artist more of yeah. you know like it's almost like you're being hired as as the artist rather than to like you know design for their style they want right. your style so it's like how do you how is it hard to compromise or figure out when to push back you know um yeah like I think earlier before I established my style that was a very contentious issue because it was a lot of back and forth and I was more like a graphic designer in that sense at that point right. in time but sort of like post 2020 I had I'd taken the time to really dig into my purpose and my why and my message and knowing that very clearly then established the style I have right now and then brands are coming to me more for the message of positivity and encouragement and the style is sort of the the language to carry that message forward and it makes sense there have been times when they've asked for changes and generally that's to do with brand colors and i'm usually okay with that because I understand their point of view right. as well. They they need to be represented in this. It has to be somewhat collaborative as long as the key message is there and the style is still clear, you know? Yeah. Right. So right. The, there is always layers of compromise, but I, I've, I've found um, when you go into a meeting and you lay out exactly how you work, like down to the bone saying, you know, this is process one, here's what we're going to do at this stage, this stage, this stage, then the expectation is super clear. And yep. when we have that right at the start, then there's less of that back and forth down the line, because we've already spoken about it. And they know right. how you've already I work. set the expectation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I know it's so I don't think people realize like how key communication is in having a successful career that you're not completely stressed out about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, if you know, I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just not a good writer, and that's just it. I'm just an artist, I can't write, and that's just the way it is. And I don't like talking to people. And if they can't send me an email, F them, you know. And it's like <laughs> it's easy to get there because it's like I hate writing emails too, and I hate talking on the phone and doing endless Zoom meetings. But it's like there is an art form to that, and that absolutely gives you so much more freedom and trust from the client. If you can Once win that you, early on. Exactly. Yeah. When you get to the creative part. Yep. So I feel like it is one of those things that should be encouraged more, maybe in design school, you know, is like how to, how to talk to people, how to meet people where they're at, how to say no, but actually like say yes, but you're actually saying no, you know, like how to make someone feel like you're, you're meeting them in the middle when you're really trying to say like, but we're actually going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sometimes you do meet in the middle because sometimes your clients do just know they know their industry better than we ever could or mm -hmm. you know they also are humans that just have you know interesting ideas like everyone's coming to the table with something so it's like I just maybe th maybe if they taught us all in school that like it's not compromise it's collaboration you know yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. um I feel like that that could be helpful because it's like I feel like you're always seeing people on Twitter that, that are I don't know they just like they're so emphatic about certain things you know and they make you feel like you're such a sellout if you're like, you know, if you're compromising or whatever. <laughs> it's like, I would never compromise my vision. It's like, but, you know, some of the greatest movies and like, like, you know, you think about like Spielberg and George Lucas mm. and, um, and Brian De Palma and that whole crew that were friends. And they used to like get feedback from each other and help each other with shots. Like apparently George Lucas showed that group. There's a few others and I forget who else was in that group. He showed them his early, um, you know, first look at Star Wars and it just starts. And they're like, okay, but where are we? What's <laughs> happening? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but I'm just like a little overwhelmed with this whole universe. What if you start with some sort of a text that lets people know like what the background is? And yeah, that's yeah. how you got that kind of like oh, going yeah. into space, iconic. like iconic. So it's like, that was the idea of great, you know, peers that he, you yeah, know, collaboration. To. It would yeah. be so easy to be like, you guys are stupid. You just don't <laughs> understand my vision, you know, but it's instead now there's that like iconic, you know, moment in that beginning of the movie. But yeah, I think a part of it is as well that as creators, more often we come to the table expecting the client to have expectations, but we don't set our own expectations mm -hmm. in place yeah. or like it's unsaid and we're just thinking it in our heads rather yeah. than speaking it out. And then we feel like hurt that they didn't understand us or, right, or like right. they're asking for things, but we didn't set the agenda. And I think yes. it's like, a, I think it has to be equal parts there where the, the, the client brings their agenda. We bring a part of our agenda or at least 
what our expectation is and then you know it's that that coming together that creates magic yeah totally well and so many people think oh i put it in the contract nobody reads the contract (laughs) it's like you've got to make that process and the boundaries clear like more casually and more regularly like so it's not just in the proposal it's not just in the agreement but when you send the first proof like at the end of all of our proofs and check-in decks at the last page it'll say like uh, at a glance where we're at it'll say what we've completed what we're working on and what's coming up next so that they're constantly reminded of the scope parameters and so it's like it's way less likely after we started doing that that people get frustrated first of all at not knowing what's happening or what's going to happen next because uh, most of the time people check in with those kind of panicked emails or like where are we it's because yeah, you yeah. haven't reminded them of what what to expect next um and then the second thing is is that they're constantly reminded of like the the boundaries of when it's done or like how much they get so that they aren't like asking for more than than they're given or at least they know okay i'm going to go beyond the scope and i know that that will cost more or whatever it is you know yeah and like speaking of client relationships you guys work with some notoriously difficult clients like this needs to be known to be really pedantic with contracts and you know uh, how they work things very specifically and you guys have worked on a couple of projects with them so i'm curious what that that has been like for you how have you been able to negotiate and navigate it so that it is a fruitful relationship I think that's another thing like you were saying like uh creatives getting used to just like knowing boundaries and being comfortable talking about it more um openly and not like defensively but just like hey this is just how it is and so when we started working with bigger and bigger clients um leading up to Disney, even it's just like the bigger it is, the more risk for them there is for things to go wrong. Like if we mess up, I mean, that could mean millions or billions of dollars for larger companies, depending on what you're working on. So um, obviously there's a lot of risk there and that's why all the, you know, uh, safeguards, safeguards are in place, whether it's like required insurances or really crazy agreements. But having said that as a creative, you know, with all clients, you have to also go in knowing that they're protecting themselves, but they're not inherently protecting you in their contract that's not what their lawyers were hired to do so you do have to kind of go in and and just make sure of everything obviously so um not with disney but with certain you know other clients like you know some of the contracts can be you know pretty limiting as far as even just sharing the work. And for us, that's a must have. It's like, if we can't share the work, that's how we get in other work. So we've really gotten used to learning to read contracts, learning what the terms mean and looking for some of these things that we know, like, Hey, we've got to negotiate this out because like, that's how we get work. And that's what we tell them. Hey, if if we can't share the work, it's going to cost more because this is how we promote ourselves. And we're going to have to work extra hard now to promote ourselves (laughs) because we can't share it. So, and usually they're always chill with us eventually taking it out. And if they're not, to be honest, they never really have a good reason. They most always it's out of fear. They just don't want to be bothered with taking it out, which it's so easy to edit out. So sometimes that's a red flag. Um, that wasn't again, Disney was cool. And, and they, they worked with us to get uh, the ability for us to share uh, work. Yeah. So that was really great. And I think as you go along in your career, you realize it can't hurt to ask, right? right. Yeah. Especially if there's no good, like we always tell them, like everything will stay completely confidential until the project is made public by you. And once you've given written approval, then we can share. So yeah. all the safeguards are still there to protect the client, but it's like, we got to be able to share. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, so and it's like, I think uh, that's also too, like just learning how to communicate with the way, you know, sometimes you have to kind of adjust your communication for the client. Mm-hmm. And so they just had a different process than we were used to. So we were like, yeah, we can adopt that process. And that did take a, a little bit of learning just because they are an almost like an art studio, you know, it's mm. like, it's looked at much more as like art than like a logo process, you know? Yeah. So just kind of like adjusting to meet their kind of the way they like to work mm-hmm. um, to make sure that, you know, they see that we're also Team players, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, yeah. Disney's not going to adjust to work like no. we want to work, yeah, and yeah. if we want to work with them, we've got to you know learn to work like they want to work. Exactly. Like, yeah. So uh, yeah. So but that but luckily we our contact that got us into Disney was somebody we had worked with for a long time before. Shout out to Nary Revis. And um, he used to work at 20th Century before they got bought out by Disney. So we already had a really good working relationship. And um, so I feel like we were so lucky to kind of get like ushered in along with Because those, it is hard to get onboarded onto the, uh, you know, into big companies yeah. as a vendor. Yeah. There's just a lot of checks and balances to go through. So that was cool. And we met Neri, he found us on Instagram through just like searching hashtags and like looking for new artists. So it speaks to the power of sharing your work, you know, <laughs> totally. I mean, totally. There's like three 
hot things that I heard there that are fantastic for creatives and freelancers. Number one, all contracts are negotiable to a level. Mm -hmm. So always ask and try and get your share because the client will always protect themselves. Uh, Number two, it's who you know. So (laughs) be nice to people, okay? I know. (laughs) And then number three, um, I just blanked on that. Well, what did you well you know, speaking of being nice to people, though, while you're thinking about the third yeah. one, Neri, who got the job at 20th Century Fox, we were asking him, how did you get the job at being an art director? Like, that's like enviable, that position. And he goes, I was working at another company. It's I think like it was like agency. apparel or was it an yeah, agency? Yeah, they worked with Nike. And, and they had a print vendor who had a press check tech whose wife knew <laughs> someone who needed who knew that this 20th century position was hiring. The press tech liked (laughs) Neri just from this relationship that had nothing to do with this potential. You know what I mean? Like it's such a far uh, connect. And, um, but because he, they had a good relationship and he was always good to him and they they, like had good rapport. He told them about it and, you know, they put a good word in and all that. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. It it just goes to show. I think sometimes people look at like uh, jobs or people as and they're like what can you do for me are you at a level that I should care and it's yeah. like you cannot think about it like that first of all that's just a horrible thing to do <laughs> second because we were all nobody like everyone yeah. starts out nowhere yeah. like you yeah. know like so it's like if you wait that's just so gross to think about it that way but second of all it's never the person you expect no it's literally never the person you nope, expect that not. hooks you up with the really cool job that leads to the really cool thing and sometimes like the smaller projects that like have no budget it's like maybe a mom and pop that no one's ever heard of the work is able to like flourish in a way that maybe it couldn't under the constraints of like a corporate project. And that leads to amazing corporate work because they see the beautiful executed, Mm -hmm. you know, smaller projects. And then they, they see, you know, the physical potential that maybe they would have been scared to try, you know, if they hadn't seen it. So, Yeah. Yeah. I just remembered my last point as well, which oh, was ooh, still, let's come back, let's come back. share your work on Instagram or <laughs> social it. media. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's so of, simple, but it's like, put it out there, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> um, speaking of small projects, that dental project that you guys did, was that like a, a small, because that, that project is amazing because it shows the breadth of everything from like branding to spatial use of your yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, which oh, is really cool. We have to give yeah. props to um, Tyler Hanks and Dustin Locke. Yeah. Uh, so Dustin Locke and his wife did all of the like environmental planning design as far as like the textures, planning the space. And then they tagged us in and were like, okay, now you do these murals. You help us make these games. You do the basketball But they court. had this, yeah. and Tyler Hanks, they had this vision to just make like kids dentistry cool which it's like thank goodness someone <laughs> yeah. finally yeah. stepped in it's like if when i was you know we te- went to a really cool dentist in syracuse there was a pirate ship in the middle of the dentist office <laughs> and you could like awesome. go in and there were stuffed animals and it, like i remember just loving going there and so that's what he wanted to create was something where kids were excited to go they weren't scared mm. but i'm yeah. telling you that because one person was willing to do it like exciting so after he did it, it was like, everyone was like, wow, we can do this. We're allowed. And like, now, like we are inundated with pediatric dentistry, yeah. like requests, but it's like, once you've done it, you can't just like, I mean, we could, we could niche in pediatric dentistry. <laughs> I mean, and that's how niching happens. I feel like people try and force a niche before they've actually got the demand to like, to actually like be able to support it. But yeah. it's like, really, you have to do one thing great. And then everyone sees it. And then they're like, and now that's all we want you to do. Totally. But anyways, we, we didn't like, we, I'd, I'd love to know what Jones knows where she did like leading up to being like the fast food yeah. rebrand company, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what was this? Yeah. Anyways, but um, yeah. Oh, but sp- speaking of like getting work from the strangest places, ILM Industrial Light Magic Dream Job. We got to do rebranding for them, and uh, when they reached out, I thought for sure, oh, our contacts at Disney sent them. Disney owns ILM. Yeah. It wasn't. It was someone in the press department. His <laughs> wife had read our- Shout out to Ian. <laughs> Ian had read our book and he told her, oh, we're thinking about rebranding. And she was like, you should check out these these girls. And she like got her book out and like, they looked us up and I'm like, what are, what are the odds? What are the odds? <laughs> you know, it's just like, uh, I, I just love that. That's wild. Yeah, it, it just goes. What's your to show, weirdest like, like client? I got the client this way. What's yeah, your the weirdest... inroad to a client? What was the weirdest? Like I heard about you from X, Y, or Z. Let me think. Uh, yeah, so 
I got to do uh, my first published book was by this the designer at the publishing house who saw my work on Instagram, thought it was cool, and then pitched it to the publisher. Oh, wow. And then you the publisher the reached out to me, which That's is wild cool. to think of how that work just showing, like, sharing your work. I hadn't even met him, and he was nice enough to do that. Uh, isn't that so awesome? Yeah, I know. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. I love that. I love that. What a small design world it is. You know, it's like, um, if you, if you put your work out there, eventually someone will see it, you know, and it will get into the right hands. I don't know. That's just, that's such a cool story. I want to go back a second there because you, you were talking about niching and this is again, a very controversial subject among designers and creatives. Half the population says niche down. The other half says don't niche. What's your hot take on it? My take is niche on skill first yeah if anything and not too niche right but like for us like we did everything to start because we didn't have any clients i think at first you cannot limit yourself if you yeah. don't have enough work if, if you need the cash flow. if you need the cash flow and you you don't have a steady you know client base yet you just got to do whatever you can get to be honest um while you're working to start presenting you know a story that attracts the ideal work you want to get so we would take anything that would come our way. If someone said, can you do a catalog? Yeah, if you, can you do this? Sure, we'll figure it out. But at the same time, we were realizing, oh, we really like to do, well, we had never done a logo before. Someone asked us to do it. Again, we never thought we would. We just said, sure, we'll, we'll do it because it'll pay a bill. And then we realized we really like doing that. And the more we shared that kind of work, the more we realized we really like to do not just logos, but brand identity systems. So we started to kind of take off any, once we could, you know, get enough of that work in, we took any of the work on our website off. That was just like the stuff that started to become really like kind of a drain, like the one-off t-shirt projects that people <laughs> only had a hundred dollars for, or like, you know, yeah. stuff like that, that we knew, okay, I think we're done with that phase, you know, and we only tried to show, um, you know, branding work. Well, the problem was people kept coming to us for just a logo. So we started just like giving them like the easiest upsell. Like we would add something stupid, like for 200 extra dollars, you get this whole package. Like <laughs> and a stationary we, set. And we would it. like, yeah. you know, build in the business card, the logo type color, make it a full system. And we did that for a few people just to get that full project up. And so we started, you know, presenting, like you said, a, a story about what we were on the website. And we said, we are a brand identity studio. And then eventually that's what people, you know, like, said that they could come to us for but I think what people often do is they try and niche not only by skill but also by industry and they mm. or by um type of client and they do it too quickly and they they don't have that reputation yet you know so everybody wants to work with restaurants of course you know I see a ton of people who try and niche for nonprofits, which sounds good in theory but they don't have any money, no money. so it's like that's something that you do as a passion but you have to have other clients that come in and bring you paid work. Otherwise you will literally not make it as a business, like, yeah. or unless you just thrive on like donations, you know, and like people funding you, you know? Yeah. So I think, um, people think, oh, I've got to make a decision now. You really don't just do good work for, for anyone <laughs> until you figure out right. who that ideal pool is. And I think it different differs per person, you know, yeah. it's mm -hmm. like, Sometimes it becomes very clear that like, I am really good at this thing and this is what everyone wants from me. And mm -hmm. like, I am soaring. And then <laughs> sometimes you're just more of a generalist. You're more of a production designer who can take mm -hmm. someone's established vision and just run with it and make everything really nice and cohesive. That is a huge skill that I find when I find people like that, I hold on to them because I think for some reason it's like, because of all the niching talk, people like that think that, you know, it's like, they don't want to talk about it or they don't want to be seen that way. And it's like, no, no, this is a skill that is yeah. like under undervalued, I think. So it's like, you can be a generalist and still have a great life, get great rates um, and have a really nice career, you know, and mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah. I think it just kind of depends on your skill type and um, yeah. yeah, things like that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the truth is with the creative industry, there's no one answer. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, there's it. so many pots to get there. Yes. And it's a question of mixing your personality with what you want yeah. out of like your creative career and then the skills you have or learning to upskill those skills. So you figure out um, the, or you get the projects that you want to get. And right. uh, speaking of getting the projects you want to get, I, I wonder 
uh, did you create personal projects that then got you the work like that you wanted to get or uh, did that just happen organically for you? Absolutely. Were you conscious about that? Yeah, at, pretty soon on it, it started happening. We did it by accident and then you start to realize that I don't even think I did it by accident. I think I was subconsciously thinking, you know, I had a, this t- Taylor Swift mastermind thing going in, uh, on in my subconscious <laughs> of how I was going to going to do this. But um, it's like, you know, I really always loved like, you know, I think, you, you know, living, living around here in Orange County, uh, California, there's like a lot of custom culture of like, you know, um, hot rods and, you know, old car, classic cars and, um, you know, surf skate, all that. There's a huge industry for that here, like action sports. And um, I always thought it would be so fun to work in that realm just because we knew a lot of people in that realm. And um, it just seemed like that was where a lot of the creative fun work was happening. And after doing catalogs and, you know, coupon mailers, it was like, that sounded really fun. So I started just making my own kind of, you know, posters and designs and just sharing them. And sure enough, you start to attract, you know, I started learning how to do one shot sign painting and started doing sign painting for my friends' businesses. I started doing logos for like, you know, old school style barbers and sure enough, you start to like get embedded in this culture of like, you know, you know, um, all that sort of thing. Well, and you, you started making your own goods under that, uh, odds and sods. So like we started a little goods company who hasn't as a designer (laughs) and we've all been there. We've all been there. And, uh, but I think that was the perfect outlet for you to try it, like to create a brand from scratch and to create the kind of like designed merch and like packaging, because we were like, we know we can do this kind of stuff and it would be so fun to, we almost wanted to give ourselves an excuse to, and we didn't think of it as a passion project. We're just like, we want to make this stuff. Let's just see. Same thing with, we started a creative meetup to try and meet people in the OC area because everyone is always talking about LA, but nobody was like hanging out in Orange County. So we were like, let's, let's get like some friends together. And And I think it was, I think mainly it was Cole Casilius and Joel Buchelman, our friends, they were, had the idea that they were like, let's just all meet up at our friend Ryan Hack's studio, like once a month and get coffee and talk shop. Yeah. And like what started as like just seven close friends ended up being like 250 people monthly coming for a free talk. And we branded it because we were like, well, we can't just do it. We have to make a logo and a website. (laughs) So like, I think any chance we could, we were like, oh, this would be a good excuse to show that we can do this. Like, you know, so, and we, we tend to like to do projects where it's like, it's not just something fake. It's like, it's something we actually want and need. And like, uh, but it's maybe not like, right. Like not a passion projects where it's like, this is a fake company and this is what I would do. Like, yeah. it's yeah. like actually trying to think of like, what do I love? What do I believe in? What could I make that could be a real thing right. that could live? Yeah. Cause I feel like that has so much more power to, and for some reason clients can sniff it out. They're like fake project can tell, like, I don't know why there's something interesting about it. So it's like, if you can figure out something real that you can make or that you can, you know, donate your services to like something you believe in, Mm -hmm. I feel like that's such a better route. Even uh, there was a, let's see, Eric Mortensen and this uh, studio called Skinny Ships put together this thing called 10 by, which at the end of every year, they would invite some artists to pick their 10 favorite albums and redesign the album covers. So it was like a passion project, but it's not fake. It's for real albums, real artists. And it looks, it's really impressive by the end of it, you have like 10 really incredible looking like designs that you share. And um, that's another great passion project. That's not just like, oh, I redesigned Gatorade, but like they'll probably (laughs) never pick it because they didn't ask me to now, <laughs> and now they're horribly offended that I've done this. Yeah, you know, or you whatever. Know what I mean, like, which yeah. no offense anyone yeah. who redesigns, but it's just like when I search that and I'm trying to find the real rebrand, and I'm like, wait, is this the real rebrand? No, this <laughs> isn't the brand they're using. Like, it always makes me frustrated. Yeah, I think I think uh, that's an important point is tapping into your own passions and curiosity, especially onto things you're really interested in, like like the one shots. Um, sign painting that's very niche in in some ways like that was huge I remember in like 2018 was so every, everybody yes. was doing oh, like, oh, sign I, I, for some reason here it was like a 20 2013 thing I don't know oh, but yeah. yeah that I totally remember that um and so like uh, yeah you see that and then you're like oh I wonder if I could do that maybe <laughs> I should just try you know and then suddenly Ten renditions later, you're getting hired to do it because you showed the work or you yeah. showed your work or your rendition of it. I want that to be in my gravestone. I should just try that. Like <laughs> That's kind of my life motto of like, I, I think I could do that. You know, yeah. it, I think though early on, like, because so our, our grandma, like, uh, 
her and our grandpa ran the country store in in their little town and so they were kind of like entrepreneurs not in like the big mega sense but like in the small town sense and then she you know the money she earned from that she got apartments and ran those and then because of that like our mom tried to start her own business you know and so I think from a young age we always just saw like that people were just like if they wanted to do something they would just try and do it and our grandpa built his own house and he would just like build buggies from from scraps from the uh, dump like he would just 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 go get wheels and like and then he would meld them into like axles and he built us like buggies and stuff like he it was basically just like can you find something to make then make it like it right. was kind of without saying it they never said that they just showed showed us that I so I think like. that mentality was always like surely we could just hack that together <laughs> and you know what's so funny it's like most of the time we were like we want to do that but we're too embarrassed to ask people to help us or to <laughs> to find out like to ask so-and-so how so we'll just try and like figure it out and like if it's awful we'll just hide it <laughs> but like most of the time by just trying to figure it out and like jerry writing it together you find out that you did it pretty close to the way that most other people do it you know it's like there's really not that many secrets out there you just gotta try and through trial and error you eventually figure it out if you do enough research you know yeah we I have a, a word for that in india it's called jugad and Ooh. it's like for anything that's sort of like stuck together and like made so like uh, in India there's a lot of places they can't afford to buy like a motorbike or something like that so they'll take a water pump and they stick it to their bicycle and they get it working and that's like their transport so that's, you that's gotta, like, incredible water pump I'm bicycle. so impressed by people like that. Right. Like this, um, somebody just joined our course. We have a, a course based on our book. It's called Freelance and Business and Stuff, the course. And um, so this <laughs> kid <plug>. from, <laughs> just a slight plug there, <laughs> freelanceandbusiness.com. Uh, but uh, this kid just joined and he introduced himself and he's from Saigon. Oh, and I wish I could remember his name, but, um, and he uh, he started this thing to just get people excited about culture and what's going on in Saigon. And it's called Straight From Saigon. And um, he made his own, like, that he made a logo that he gives to all these, like, entrepreneurs. He helps them do all these things. And everyone uses this little mark to, as kind of a, like, made in Saigon thing. And he's, like, gathering this whole creative community around this thing that he created and he's like just fresh out of school, just you know, fresh on the design scene, and didn't think hmm, maybe I'm not like far enough along to start this. He just thought, you know, what we should do is galvanize this whole city. Like, yeah. And I just love that kind of like bravado. Um, I don't even know if it's bravado. It's like um, confidence and just excitement and like you said, passion about mm. like getting you know gathering creatives and just whatever it is you're doing. So shout out, shout out to him because I was like, good for you, man. Like this is just so cool. Um, I'm I'm wondering about your branding process for yourselves because I I think a lot of the times when we we're really good at creating stuff for other people, but then for ourselves it can be quite challenging because you're like you know the it's not as clear sometimes. So I was wondering yeah. what what was that process for yourself branding yourself, getting yourself out there. Um, building a social media presence was it conscious was it happening organically and then you realized okay let's be strategic about this what was that process like for you guys I think we designed our logo on a weekend like I think you designed it Mm -hmm. we kind of like sketched it together and then we made the website like on a weekend your boyfriend helped us yeah my (laughs) My former boyfriend helped us. Amy's boyfriend knew WordPress. And uh, we made the website. We got a theme. And like you said, we, what's it called? Jugad? What's yeah, it called? Jugad. Like, yeah. Yeah, we did that. And then we just <laughs> taped it together, wrapped some duct tape around it. And, and I think- just put the V1 out there. Like we just, I mean- we, I think the key was we didn't treat it too precious. We just knew we needed to get a website up. Like we just got the V1 up, just get the V1 up. Like it doesn't yeah, have to yeah. be your forever branding. I think the sooner you realize like, let's just get something up here. Let's just make something live, like the better. And then eventually like we did start honing it. But interestingly, I think you are the Hudspa brander. Like you, yeah. you do the Hudspa design, like you design for Hudspa. Yeah. Like sometimes when you ask me to design something for Hudspa, I get like panicked. <laughs> I'm like, do I know how to do this style? <laughs> of course I do. But it's just That's so like, true. I don't know. I think it just developed from your sensibility. But I think like at the end of the day, if you get overwhelmed with how to do your own brand, I think it's like at the bare minimum, just cool, choose a cool typeface 
like a nice typeface, just type out your brand name, use a good typeface, and then let the work speak for itself. Like, I think it's kind of fine for some, you know, designers to have a little bit more of a nondescript brand if they're going to be doing more of like client side work that's morphing to that client's brand, you know? Yeah. Um, that said, I like people like, like your logo is so you. Yes. And it's like your, you know, your, um, you know, lettering style. And I always wanted our brand to be like that, to where it's like we brand ourselves and that's like a way that you can see what we can do for you mm -hmm. as the client. You know, it's like, I always really looked up to like Fuzzco, their design studio um, on the East coast and they are like young jerks or, or young like jerks, oh, yeah. you know, the dance early on before they even like melded. Yeah. Just people yeah. who like take the time to make their own brand interesting and unique and something that stands out. And that is how you become, you know, a more sought after, you know, studio. If you don't have like, you know, the big name, the banner name, the big name founders, or like, you know, if you don't have like someone from Pentagram helping you start yeah, yeah. up your studio, yeah. you know, like you do have to be kind of scrappy and kind of show off your personality and start to kind of attract your own little audience that, especially if you want to do like what you do, which is like selling art or selling, you know, goods or, or, you know, courses or anything like that. I think it's, it's, it is important to take the time like you did and saying like, who am I? Like, what's my style? What do I want to be known for? How do I start creating a design system that I can easily start going to set of colors, set of fonts so that when I need to, you know, make stuff for myself, which I should be doing, I should be promoting myself. It becomes this nice cohesive thing that people say, Oh, like our friend Kara Sykes will just text us sometimes. And she'd be like, look, I found the hoods colors and she'll be like at a thrift shop or something. And I, nice. I love that. I'm like, that is success in my mind. When someone sends something to me and says, did you do this? Or look, it's your font. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, this is the best thing you could ask for. It's like having the Wes Anderson style, the Quentin Tarantino style. Like there's certain artists or creatives who are able to do that. It's not easy, but I feel like it is, it can be super valuable if, if you are able to find that voice. Yeah. You've been building this brand, but you started like quitting college and all the rest. And now you're working with like the NBA and Disney and stuff like that. Uh, do you ever get imposter syndrome when you're sitting oh, in man. that room? We constantly have it. Oh, we constantly I, have I, it. I feel like I'm either flying high. No one can tell me nothing. I feel like I'm just, uh, I know it all. Or I'm like, oh, it's my. a healthy mix of both. It's yeah. to be sure. Because I think from a young age, we're always like, we can figure it out. Like I could do that. Yeah, we, we do have a, a, a blind and naive confidence. <laughs> but and a naive confidence is the perfect word for it. So like that is helpful to just put yourself out there. But then once you get there, you're, you're like, shit, do I actually know oh, how to do anything? Yeah, like when you get these big clients, you're like, I'm always like so excited. I'm like, oh, we're gonna do such a great job. It's gonna be amazing. But then like 10 minutes before the first discovery call with the big client, you're like, oh my gosh, like just, you know, maybe they work in a different way. I, I want to make sure that we're communicating in a way that is respectful or like engaging. You just kind of always hope that you connect a little because it's the worst when you can't kind of find that kind of rapport early yeah, on. Yeah. yeah. But like, I think that what I realized after all of it is that like, we're not all that different, even at yeah. the highest echelons, they're still, the people working there are just like us. They're just normal people trying to please a boss, trying to make yeah. a dime, trying They're, to meet a deadline, <laughs> trying to meet a deadline. They're just normal people. So the, like the quicker you can kind of get away from like the, um, kind of like, yeah, glory, the glorifying it yes. like on a pedestal and just realize, okay, these are just normal people like me. Um, and to be honest, like when we've gone into a lot of these big, um, to meet and work with these clients, like, and we wonder about our process, like at the end of the day, we always realize like our process is almost the same as yeah. anybody else's. Like there's really no secrets in how to run a group. It's like, it's pretty straightforward. You just, you have to talk, you have to listen, you have to <laughs> research, you have to gather everyone's thoughts. You have to test everyone's thoughts against, you know, the reality of what's going on in the competitors and all that. And you just have to put it together and into like, you know, cohesive, like presentations, like however you do that is up to you, Figma, InDesign, whatever. Yeah. But it's really just a matter of like how you communicate goals clearly, how you guide people along. And I think those are, are kind of a little bit more nuanced skills of communication. It's, and I think people often worry about the process more, um, but it, however you do it, whatever the programs are, it's kind of all the same, you know? I actually heard a really interesting interview. Like it was a clip on TikTok of Matthew McConaughey and apparently it was when he was young and he was in the same room or like somebody introduced him to Joel or Ethan Cohen. I can't remember which one. And they were talking about something, talking about a film or something. 
And then they basically asked him like, what do you think? And he was so nervous that he just like, he kind of just did like a, I don't know, just kind of like uh, deferred to them or didn't really have an say an opinion or wasn't really himself because he was just too starstruck. Yeah. And so after that, he was like, basically he ran into them again, 10 years later and they were like, oh, nice to meet you. He was like, I've actually met you, but I, you literally forgot about me because I was too worried about who you were to actually be a part of this epic moment. <laughs> right. And he's like, so I, he goes, I went out and I carved into a tree be in the moment or something like that it was so Matthew McConaughey but um but basically he just said like I'm never going to be starstruck again like yeah. I'm just going to be a part of the moment that I've been waiting my whole life to be yeah. a part of instead yes. of like getting hung up on like oh it's Joel Cohen you know it's like I think everyone just wants to be you know just to communicate and just like be heard and like, have a laugh at the end of the day yeah. you know yeah. and they're all people you know and yeah. <laughs> We're all just regular people at the end of the day, trying to make a living. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so that should be the the homework then is everyone just go carve in a tree. <laughs> Somebody in Malibu, <laughs> find the tree or Venice, find the tree that Matthew carved that into. I want a photo. <laughs> just everyone's out there defa yeah. defacing trees in the name of positivity. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll slowly bring this interview to an end and I want to know what is one piece of advice you would give a young creator today I think I, I like the was it again Jardin what is it I want to remember it Jagad Jagad okay I like that idea of like just try to start small try making something little like if you have a big idea I think that's another thing too is people think it has to be this big thing before they start it's like no no start yeah. small test it a little, see if anyone else is kind of feeling it. See if there's like a, a demand or an excitement there. And um, like Christopher Nolan was working full time when he did his first film and he, they filmed it across two years. They would just do one hour every day, basically. And it's like, that's how he filmed this first movie. And I feel like, you know, it doesn't have to be this big thing where you're like, I have to quit my job and spend yeah, three yeah. months in the Alps, like alone, finding myself. Like <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. You can, like if you have yeah. the means, but yeah. I feel like, you know, maybe it's just spending an hour for a month every day after your day job and just like, like you did finding your style, but just trying a little and not being too scared and just sharing what you do. I look back on some of our live streams and I'm like, like oof, like it's, it's, I already see how much I've improved even just since last year. So I think it's just like, share your work though. People like to see the process and just try, just yeah. try small and just cobble what you've got together. <laughs> um, okay. My advice is twofold. Firstly, you got to learn to be grateful for the people in your life who support you and help you even grateful for the people who say, you know, brutally honest things to you that, you know, I mean, but I think it's like, none of us can get anywhere purely on our own. People who say I'm self-taught, I'm always like, did you live in a vacuum and literally <laughs> invent design? No, <laughs> like you read a book, you watched yeah. a video, yeah. like we all, there's no such thing as self-taught. Yeah. And based on that. I think a lot of times as creatives, we think oh, I have to create something from nothing. Otherwise I'm yeah. a hack, you know? So it's like, I think if you can get used to the idea of um, being a good researcher and just doing the research, that doesn't mean going to school for four years. I mean, just like get online, figure it out, find the resources, go to the library, like look stuff up, research stuff, and then just try it. Like, don't, don't wait for like the certificate or the whatever, you know, like ask people, um, ask questions and then, you know, just, and then if you need, you know, to fill in the holes in your education, yeah, take the class. Sure. Yeah. But there's nothing like, wrong with taking the class, but, but it's like, you know, test, test it out. See if it's even for you. I feel like there's so many people who are like, I did two years of this. And then I realized I didn't like that. I got, I got my master's. Two years I got my master's. And then I realized and then I, I hated it. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm just the debt alone <laughs> yeah. and the time spent, you know, it's like, just, just try a little. That's true. Yeah. 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 I, I love that because I, I think, too often we we give too much credence to this idea of like being super original something that nobody else has done but the the fact is we're all just iterating on existing things and like even the greats like da vinci or whatever would have copied other artists in his time masterpieces and then eventually developed his style uh yeah. which is like the combination of lots 100%. of little, little things sticking together Oh, and they um, found out that Vermeer was just tracing the whole time. Like he had created <laughs> these incredible, like simple, but incredibly powerful machines to just yeah. trace 
perfectly. And wow. it's just like, and it's so beautiful. It's but like, it's still got his, it's it still, still has his touch and it still has, yeah. you know, there's still a bit of him in there. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's like saying just because I use Adobe Illustrator, like I cheated, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. that was just yeah. a tool. It was still him. It was still his thing. So yeah. yeah, I love that though. It's so true. We are all building on the shoulders of those who came before us. Um, so for the last question, the the one I like to ask all my guests is, what does the word fruitful mean to you? Ooh, 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 ooh. abounding. It's like, there's not just enough for you. It's yeah. not like a hoarding because it's like scarcity. It's like, there's enough, there's fullness overflowing where mm. others can also be benefited and, and, and have that kind of, and share in the, the bounty of, it's like, <laughs> you know, those like those old paintings of like yeah. a, a horn and then there's like <laughs> fruit coming out of the horn and it's like, yeah, there's yeah. like a, a feast, feast going on and people are talking about Valhalla. <laughs> <laughs> That's so <laughs> imagine <laughs> but I think that it, there's something to that it's like you know it, when I look back on our career it's always we actually did an exercise where we tracked a lot of our big jobs back to like the person that referred us or the the connection that led to it and it's always people at the end of the day yeah. and so I think um being fruitful is like you know having those connections and having those and I connections is such a gross word it, I want it to be bigger than that whatever the bigger word for that is the more meaningful word for that relationships is. Yes, relationships. Having those relationships where like people, they like what you're doing, but they also just like you as a person and they're willing yeah. to, to to say like, hey, this person's great, you should try them. Like that is so invaluable. And I, it's just like, I'm always so thankful for those people in our lives that have helped us along the way. And I always try to do that when we can. It's like bringing in people for projects or you know, referring something on to a friend if we can't take it on. It's like, those are such easy things that, that can really make a huge difference in someone else's life to just getting that next project, that little bit bigger project, that, you know, vote of confidence, whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. And hey, thank you all for listening to this episode of The Fruitful Life. I hope you walk away with some nuggets of wisdom. And if you did, please do me a favor and leave a rating and a comment to tell me how you think the show is going. Also consider telling a friend that might like it. As always, be true, be you, stay fruitful.